guests. May I first turn to the family, and I speak on behalf of the BBC and our millions of audiences around the world. May I speak to Professor Dumour, to Quantima, to Corshi, and Mawena. We cannot comprehend the pain that you are suffering, but we share in your grief. We hold you up and we will stand with you. I wish to share with you some of the remarks that I made in the Thanksgiving service in London two weeks ago, and to tell you something of the impact of Connor's death on the world. To understand the impact of his death, you only need to look at what happened in those last few weeks. The BBC's audiences around the world responded immediately in their hundreds of thousands, besieging us with their grief and their admiration for Conla and what he had achieved. Even greater, of course, was the impact on his BBC friends. I visited Conla's home myself the day after his loss to pay my respects and offer support to his wife and their beautiful children, alongside colleagues from BBC Africa and his closest friends. We were all numbed. Personally, I felt poaxed at the loss of a dear friend, and we all felt we had lost our big, our very big brother. The next day, we organized an informal gathering in a church right next to the BBC in the center of London. Hundreds of colleagues came spontaneously to share their grief and shock and to grieve together. Then we held a thanksgiving for Conla on Saturday, February the 1st. It was in the magnificent St. Martin in the Fields Church on the historic Trafalgar Square on a cold but brightly sunny day. The best of Ghana and the United Kingdom came together with many dignitaries, and regular folk paying their heartfelt tributes in eulogies, songs, and prayers. Then just 10 days ago, a further remarkable tribute. The Prince of Wales, visiting the new BBC headquarters, broke off his tour to write his condolences in a book dedicated to Comla. I have since presented that condolence book and a photograph of Prince Charles signing that book to Professor Dumour. The extraordinary tributes that London, the BBC, and the BBC's global audience paid to Comla are powerful signs of the respect and love in which he was held. How was such strong emotion created? I think it was because of the genius of his great combination of a life-enhancing personality with his exceptional journalistic talent. When he joined the BBC, Comla exploded onto the radio and the TV screen he became the personalization of the BBC's commitment to Africa with the program that was his, Focus on Africa on BBC World News. But he didn't want to be pigeonholed and he always wanted to spread his wings with some memorable assignments. The World Cup in 2010, the British Royal Wedding, the London Olympics, the Dutch Royal Wedding, the visit of President Obama to Africa, his interview with Bill Clinton, and still to come, but tragically unrealized, his anchoring of the BBC's coverage of the forthcoming World Cup in Brazil. Comla adored and celebrated his Africanness and Africa, but he was also an African journalist for the whole world, telling stories in a way that everyone could relate to, and lapping up the reaction he got around the globe. After that Dutch royal wedding, he wrote to his editor, Folks here keep asking me if I'm the presenter who takes his shirt off. Live the story, boss. I've heard from BBC people who are Afghan, Arab, or Australian, many of whom never even met him, who've been in deep sorrow. How could that be? They just knew he was their guy, and they invested their hopes in him. And we know that's true of the BBC's viewers also. There's a telling story from BBC audience research that when they spoke to viewers in Hong Kong, Comla topped the list of presenters with one Chinese man saying, he's just like me. Comla represented 
a universal humanity that is irrespective of skin color, country of origin, or faith. Comla stood for us all in Africa and in the world. My last story comes from the marvelous interviews Comla secured with the family of the late Nelson Mandela just a few short weeks ago. His producer tells the story. Comla had built up a relationship with Ndaba, Madiba's grandson, after interviewing him at the London Olympics. He and Ndaba ended up having a late night whiskey together at our hotel on the Saturday after Mandela's passing. And that's when Comla received an invitation to the Mandela house. We went there pushing our way past thousands of people who were there to pay their respects to Mandela. Comla was stopped every 10 yards for photographs, autographs, hugs, and handshakes. When we finally entered the Mandela home, we came face to face with his widow, Grassa Michelle. He knelt down beside her, and she pulled him towards her saying, thank you for everything you have done for Africa. We are so proud of you, Conla. You are like a son in this house. Conla was overwhelmed and couldn't believe that she knew who he was. We'd gone over the questions for the Mandela family thoroughly beforehand. Conla was actually quite nervous. But I don't need to tell you what an amazing job he did. The Mandela family loved him from his first question and were totally relaxed in his presence. In the best of broadcasting, personality and professional skill come together. Comla was supremely gifted in both. Comla was a radiant human being with a razor sharp journalistic mind. He was an incomparable star. The world, the BBC, and I will miss him deeply. Comla, rest in peace.